Hello and welcome to Dinis Guarda YouTube podcast series and um, uh, in partnership with the openbusinesscouncil.org and citiesabc.com. Uh, once again, we are here to profile global leaders and personalities that are changing the world. And today I'm actually quite proud of this interview and actually I'm looking forward because I would say that I'm a, a fan of the personality that I'm interviewing and uh, it impacted my life. Uh, so I think the... The bio that normally I read is quite big. I probably will separate it from this part. Um, but uh, I'm interviewing Lars Sar Christensen, that is the uh, senior personality, a Danish banker, entrepreneur, and investor who co-founded what became Saxo Bank, and as well a uh, financial multi-asset trading and investment platform that has been actually changing the way trading worldwide is processed and as well changing the way Forex trading is done worldwide. But as well, it was one of the probably first iteration um, fintech companies worldwide that created a lot of things that we're discussing right now in terms of finance and technology. Uh, Lars Christensen is as well the, the founder and chairman of Concordium, a blockchain that allows individuals, business and public institutions to use permissionless blockchain technology in a way that is private, trusted, scalable, and compliance with regulations, and very focused on creating new systems for identity and different areas. Um, I think the, the CV and background of Lars is, is amazing from creating one of the most important financial institutions in Denmark, but as well in Switzerland and around the world, but as well his paper in terms of defining ideas, trends, and as well culture in terms of governance. I'm a huge fan of the work that Lars did. I, I'm, I'm as well, I was an employee of Saxo Bank, so I have a, a privilege of being working close with the organization, learning a lot, actually part of my financial, corporate and culture and management. I, I have to say with honor and respect, they were part from Lars' uh, teachings, uh, not directly, but as well as an employee that I was. And I'm actually quite privileged to be here. And I'm saying this with humble humility, but as well with a uh, proud. Um, and as well, one of the things that I, I respect about Lars is that this is capacity of thought leadership and the strong opinions in terms of ideas, finance, society, but as well in terms of changing things. Um, Lars is an active investor and as well entrepreneur that has been involved from uh, restaurant business to football and to several gourmet um, restaurants and as well the has been behind the three the first three michelin star restaurants geranium in uh, copenhagen and the iconic cafe dan turel as well in copenhagen denmark uh, i think the biography can go over i'll probably do a separate for the bio because i know that is yes as well a huge follow-up in terms of the ecosystem of saxo bank and now concordium and I'm looking forward to talk uh, and discuss ideas and the impact of his work and still the impact that is very present right now. So Lars, welcome to our series. Thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, extensive and uh, friendly introduction. I appreciate it. And nice to see you again. No, my pleasure. And I think it's, uh, I'm really humbled to, to be here with you, but as well, uh, I always learn with you. It's one of the things I love about Saxo Bank. And I hope that we transmit this to our audience worldwide of someone that's actually been leading the way, but as well with initiative, responsibility, and actually by example, which is something that I, I deeply admire. So Lars, I would like to start by, so you have a, a fantastic background um, that we could actually talk for probably a couple of hours, but I think uh, I would like to start by your basics. I think probably people don't know so much about uh, your basics, your principles, and I would like to say, because as well, being a Danish, and I know that you're very proud, although you are a citizen of the world, I think a bit about your education and base that probably is one of the things that is less known, especially from your childhood to become who you are now. Yeah, I would say uh, my education was uh, largely relevant to what I do, because uh, I, I never had a, a finance or economy uh, education uh, and although I was probably always better at mathematics than uh, than language, I, I preferred language. So uh, so I uh, I focused on that and and learned Latin and ancient Greek, uh, which has not come in helpful very often. But uh, but uh, it's a nice it's a nice hobby. Uh, but I never went to university. I took a year off uh, when I was finished with the sort of the qualifying. Uh, 
uh, earlier educations and I never got back to it because I got so excited about doing business. So I was saying everything to do with finance and economy and, and, and blockchain for that matter, I'm pretty much autodidact, but, uh, but I can, I can, I can read Latin, but it, it hasn't helped me a lot. But that, that probably brought you the ideas and the strength of mind that you have. And I think uh, I, I share that, that passion with you, <laughs> language and literature. But as well, you are a writer as well, and you have a lot of stuff. And so so let's, let's start with one question related. So being a person of language, of ancient language and literature, and as well of all these parts, how did you come back? How did you come to, to create one of the biggest and most cutting edge banks in the world? So I think that's a good story. Yeah, through uh, through a variety of uh, of ways, I would say I, I didn't actually uh, when I, when I was young, I didn't particularly look at the finance sector. But uh, when I was uh, in my early twenties, uh, I uh, I got a little bit fascinated of it. Had a couple of friends that went to London and did quite well for themselves. So I started to read the Financial Times, etc. And one day I thought, you know, I I got to go and experience that. Uh, so uh, after after doing uh, various things, uh, I had a bar in Spain, uh, I, I worked in a restaurant, and, and I thought, you know, that's fun. And actually, full circle, as you said, I, I'm now back to owning a few few good restaurants, but, uh, but I wanted something else then. And uh, I went to London, and uh, with my, my modest background from reading the Financial Times and and studying various uh, various financial uh, courses and books, I, I went around to a few brokers and said, you know, I think I can help you uh, build a market in uh, in Denmark, in particular where where I I came from. And uh, in those days in London, it was like they'd hardly ever heard about anything on the continent, you know. So for them, that was very exotic. And they said, well, let's give it a shot. And uh, and I got a, a job on my second or third interview and. Uh, and continued to learn and and and, uh, and and focused a little bit on trying to bring derivatives and uh, foreign exchange to uh, to Denmark, uh, which was not very not very widespread at the time. But I found it exciting and uh, and I had had some reasonable success with that uh, and, and got some customers, uh, uh, made some money, and uh, and then I could got the opportunity from one of my clients to, to start a small brokerage with him. Uh, my partner through many years, Kim Fournay. Uh, and we founded a very small business that uh, subsequently became Saxo Bank. Uh, first few years, I was actually working out of London, supporting this little business in my, my then job. Uh, but after a few years, I, I, I thought I'd like to be on the ground and, and joined it from about 1995, we we founded the we founded the company in 1992. So uh, so that's how I got there. And then obviously the reason to do your own thing was uh, was that some of the stuff I saw in London didn't impress me much. Uh, and then and we had this kind of feeling that maybe we could do something better. Maybe we could do something more client centric. Uh, and uh, and actually, had no idea about the internet at the time. That kind of came up, come after a couple of years, and uh, and then obviously that became our our key focus when we realized that there was something here that uh, might have transformative potential for, for not just the financial industry, but for the the world uh, as a whole. So, uh, from the time that we that we first engaged with that, we got more and more enthusiastic, and we ended up bringing out one of the world's first uh, trading platforms for for foreign exchange. And uh, subsequently, of course, that has become a much broader offering, uh, uh, much more multi-asset than than just foreign exchange. But we started with with foreign exchange, and uh, and it lent itself well to that because the old days of foreign exchange were very elitist if you will you're sitting there you have two hands two ears you know there's a limit to how many phones you can handle and you got the whole dashboard lighting up in front of you when something important happens and trying to see who you who you would pick first you know but uh but with the internet we had the ability to to service first tens and then hundreds and then thousands of people at the same time and and in many ways broadened out that industry to a much wider public than uh, than it had prior to that yeah, definitely. Saxo Bank uh, created a, 
a cutting edge revolution in terms of trading and as well was probably the first technology platform, like you said, there was an internet-based bank and internet-based trading. So can you tell us about, uh, because like you said, it was the beginning of the internet and uh, Saxe Bank from the beginning was uh, an adoptive, uh, adopted all these different parts and actually create a culture that would be bringing Silicon Valley to Denmark, but having as well the culture of Denmark to the world, which was quite unique. The the different cultures that you brought to you at Kim Forney, brought to the team, the multinationalities, the international scope, and as well the innovation, because a continuous innovation, both on technology, finance, and culture. So if you could talk about the history and the inception on that level. Yeah, of course, learning by doing and, and uh, finding ways forward that were a little bit different to how other people did thing part of the plan the first couple of years, but and it actually hardly existed in ninety two when we formed the business. But uh, but we saw the potential in that relatively early. Uh, at least we saw a way to differentiate ourselves from because nobody else was doing it. The big banks only came years later, really, with their trading platforms. Uh, e trade was an early adopter in the stock markets, but uh, but there wasn't a lot of it around. But we thought, you know, maybe. Just on this one thing, we could be, we could have a an advantage vis-a-vis the, the rest of the market. You know, when when we were doing normal trading, you know, we didn't have as much capital as the big banks. We didn't we didn't have the same beautiful marble palaces. We 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 couldn't hire million dollar analysts. You know, so 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 we were really uh, trying to find an angle, and, and that angle turned out to be the internet first with a very early website and, and subsequently, of course, with the trading platform itself. So uh, so it was very much uh, the art of the necessary and, and, and trying to think up ways that we could differentiate ourselves in a, in a fairly crowded world of people just picking up the phone and quoting you a price, you know? So, uh, so I'll say it, 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 it came a lot from that necessity to, to differentiate the, uh, Subsequently, uh, we realized that that uh, the demand was well, maybe we hit something right in the beginning. Actually, we didn't get very many clients, but we began to see interest from people that would not have spent five minutes with us before from the big banks because they were beginning to understand that that maybe this was a new new way of doing things. So all of a sudden, we had you know people from Deutsche and Goldman calling. Uh, uh, unsolicited to us, which would uh, certainly not have happened prior to that and, and didn't wasn't really justified by by our size. But but that was probably when we began to realize that maybe we had got lucky and uh, hit an early trend. And uh, the thing about the many nationalities was actually also learning by doing. You know, we, we actually had a team coming in from Portugal saying, you know, we really love this we love this platform and we want to work for you. And we're like, you know, well, we, we don't have any business in Portugal. And so that doesn't matter. We'll build it. Uh, and, uh, and they did. Uh, and, and that was kind of when we realized, you know, that we could travel a lot further than Denmark and Scandinavia. And also the benefit of having local people involved, you know, because in those days, at least it was very much, you know, if, if you, had somebody traveling out as to, to, to present what they could do. It would be English guys, American guys. The language would be English. Uh, and then we realized that actually in many ways, if you have people that speak the local language, have an understanding of that culture, uh, we also had an advantage. I would say it was actually more important to me whether people came with a new opening of a new area, a new country, a new language group, more so than whether they had an MBA or, 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 or a very impressive CV, because we saw that what worked was taking this technology, which was pretty rare at the time, you know, there was not a lot of competition. And when we could take that out and also also understand the local, the local area, the local country we were, we were going to, first of all, we wouldn't have hardly ever any direct competition and and secondly the little competition it was was traveling in from london and new york and speaking all english and uh, so so we became quite fans of, of getting as many languages as possible and, and also building the, the, the platform itself in many languages I, I think fairly early on it was in five ten languages and and, and probably 30 if not more languages today so being able to 
service people in a language, being able to give people a platform in their language, uh, being able to have people going out selling the product in, in the local language, I think has worked very well for us. And, and hence, uh, we ended up with this uh, Babel Tower of 50, 60 different nationalities uh, at, a, at a fairly early stage, which of course also is interesting from a cultural point of view because you get a lot of different inputs and uh, a much better understanding about exactly how you do business in, in Portugal, exactly how you do it in Greece, exactly how you do it in South Africa or wherever else we went. So uh, so again, that was a little bit learning by doing. We, we saw good results and we said, you know, like we always try to do, take some chances, try something a little bit uh, different. And if it worked, we would do more of it. And if it didn't work, at least sometimes we also managed to shut it down before it were it was too costly and then too much of a failure. Yeah, and, and it was really impressive being as well one of those people and as well being Portuguese and a bit French. I was there, of course, actually I was responsible actually partly to manage languages. So it was one of my tasks as well there. But one of the things that uh, I, I want to talk with our audience and explore this is so when you build the platform like you said it was the beginning of the internet i was pre-internet and then internet and there was really not something like we told we call uh trading and especially technology for trading and most like you said it was um wall street and probably london and a bit hong kong at the time and the mostly one of the things that saxo bank did was democratizing the principle of trading first by institutions using technology and then by retail trade is worldwide and like you said in sax in, in especially in forex initially but as well the different assets afterwards this actually was probably one of the first inceptions on a global scale remember there was not even fintech and i became actually one of the personality responsible for leading fintech discussions worldwide but can you tell us about the part of building the trading platform which i remember um it was it, it's still a cutting edge platform but at the time was really something very futuristic I think we were we were lucky in that our key interest at the time was foreign exchange, uh, and and foreign exchange really uh, is very concentrated in in relatively few uh, crosses, you know. So if you had the ten, twelve major crosses, you know, you had a very good selection, which would probably cover more than ninety five percent of all trading in the world, right? Uh, and uh, and it's also easier to handle than than if you wanted to link up and integrate with APIs to uh, to 15 different stock exchanges and all, all this, right? And then many, many more instruments, et cetera. So, so the, the first versions of the platform were actually fairly simple. Uh, we uh, we uh, integrated some, some price feeds. Uh, we had relatively limited selection of, uh, of, of uh, instruments, but those instruments uh, were, were popular instruments that people like to trade. I think today, I mean, I, I sold my last years in, in, in Saxo about four years ago. So I think today there's like 30 or 40,000 instruments on, on the platform in, in all sorts of asset classes. But back then, it was really the top 10 foreign exchange crosses. And, uh, and uh, you know, most trades in the world include the, include the US dollar in some shape or form. So uh, I think we were lucky in that in the early in the early iterations, the platform wasn't really that complicated. It was more the model that was new. Uh, other people could probably have built those types of platforms, but they didn't. Uh, at least only years later. And uh, so, foreign exchange is still my preferred investment area. I love foreign exchange. It's a it's a very deep market. It's a very liquid market. When you're talking the major currencies, you uh, can have big positions without shifting the markets. Uh, nobody really knows more about it than you. You know, if you take an average company, there's probably a thousand people working that company that understands better than you and external people uh, what uh, what what is important that company. But in foreign exchange, nobody really has an edge, right? I mean, uh, there might be a few central bankers here and there, uh, but. Uh, but they wouldn't go out and share that information. So it's a very democratic market in that sense. Also, you know, if you, uh, if you, you're not at a disadvantage from other people knowing important information before you do, because what is important information in the, 
inflation figure coming out. It's a trade balance figure coming out, and we all see it at the same time, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so I, I, I like foreign exchange. It's a great market, and 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 retrospectively, it was probably quite lucky that that was our focus at that time because it was an easier platform to do than if it had that to have tons of exchange integrations, etc. Yeah, so, so the platform became a cutting edge platform. And I remember that uh, at the time, although Saxo Bank was a bank, uh, most of the employees were technology people. I think, uh, I think probably 70 to 80 percent were technology people. So can you tell us about that part? How, how do you really build a very strong technology when at the time the banks were still conventional finance and so forth? I don't think it was that skewed. I, I would think most of the time after we got into our sort of full focus on that is maybe 40% technology people, I would say, right? Uh, as, I, as I recall, and I think that's roughly the situation today. But of course, that's a, still a very high percentage of, of technology people in a financial institution and certainly was back in those days when, when people were less focused on technology. Today, I guess it's more common and you might even find much higher much higher percentages but but in those days people were traders they were salespeople, they were account executives sitting there doing their phones uh and and less focus on technology so uh so it was unusual for us and i can remember internally many of those more traditional roles were like you know why are you wasting your money on this stuff it's never gonna never gonna work you know people want to speak to me on the phone you know you shouldn't shouldn't spend all our profits on this technology stuff uh, but uh, but in the end I think most of them have 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 agreed that maybe that was not such a bad solution but it wasn't as obvious at the time you know even the internet wasn't as obvious because many people in those days thought you know the internet yeah fun you can you can sit and do a few things we couldn't do and exchange information but but it's never going to be something really important it's a fad right and this sounds incredible today, but that's how many people looked at it in the mid to late 90s, right? Uh, and a little bit like the blockchain space today where people are like, yeah, this is, this is so important and not so many people using it. And I don't really understand it anyway. So so maybe maybe it's not important, right? I actually think there are many parallels between between early days of the internet and the states we're in, in, in the blockchain space, but maybe we can get back to that. But, but it wasn't as obvious in, in those days. And it wasn't so obvious either for people that it was much, much easier to sit and, and click a button and trade or hit a number and trade than, than picking up the phone. But uh, so it took time for people to adopt it. Uh, and uh, But eventually it became the way that we do things and uh, think about it anymore, right? Uh, but in those days, uh, a lot of people were highly skeptical of the internet. And it was quite hard to... To work with, uh, you know, uh, when before all the gates, gateways into uh, the internet were, were really there. You know, it's quite nerdy in the very early stages. You know, before you really had browsers, etc. Right. So, uh, so uh, I see a lot of parallels. You know, then then actually another Portuguese angle. You might like that, but but we had particular one broker in in, in Porto. In uh, in Portugal, that that liked the platform so much that they said, you know, we want a platform like that for our clients, right? Uh, and we said, well, we didn't build it for that. We built it for you to trade with us. I said, now we want one that we can give to our clients. And to be honest, we hadn't thought too much about that aspect, uh, but they were so insistent and and a, and a good client. So we said, okay, we'll try. So we, we did what subsequently became our white label strategy that other financial institutions can take our infrastructure and, and brand it in their identity, thereby obviously creating a much larger ecosystem for ourselves, people in other, in other financial institutions going out and essentially promoting our platform, right? And then we found various ways to... to uh, profit share with people making the decision easy we didn't ask a big license fee but but we we lived and died with their success rate through a through a profit split split with with these institutions but that was actually a, a portuguese broker that pushed us down that track as well and, and subsequently we realized hey you know if it worked for them it could probably work for a lot of other people and and then when I left, I think we had about 100, 120 other financial institutions using our our platform to to make a better 
trading experience for their clients, right? Uh, and, uh, and that's, of course, an important part of, of Saxo Bank's business to sit behind white labels where we may or may not be immediately visible. Uh, you know, they can plaster their own name all over it or whatever. They can say in, in collaboration with Saxo Bank, we don't really care because it leads the trading back to uh, back to Saxo Bank, right? Yeah, and, and that part of the white label became a big thing. And as well, it creates a global ecosystem of banks, brokers around the world, like you said, that bring uh, created a multi-billion dollars business. So so I think from, um, and I, I know that we're talking about Saxo Bank, and I want to talk about a lot of things. You mentioned, you mentioned the parallel between Forex trading at the time and now uh, crypto trading, which is very similar, like you said. And there's a lot of disruption levels as well because the trading levels have ended. But before going to that, so if you look at... Uh, the legacy that you left with Saxo Bank, and I know that uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of studies done, and it's still going. The areas that you feel that uh, from your legacy and the work that you did on Saxo Bank, that you really you say that is that is your top one, two, three things that you would like to highlight. I think that the the fact that we were early adopters of a new technology and that we made that work, uh, I think was was uh, was great, and that we saw it and that we. We focused on it uh, and, 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 and made that into a success, I, I think, was very important. Another thing that was always very important for me was uh, internal culture, uh, that, that people were happy to, to work with, with Saxo Bank and, and in Saxo Bank. And I think most people were and are. Uh, and, and maybe also a testament that you'll even speak to me after all these years, right? But, but I actually find when I meet people that, Maybe haven't been in Sax Bank for many years. They 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 still look back at that as an important part of their career where they they enjoyed themselves and, and learned new things. Uh, so so for that for me that was also very important. You know I I, I think uh, I think we found our own Scandinavian way of, of building a culture which is not as cutthroat as uh, as as some places in the world, right? Uh, but at the same time, we were a little bit of a of an alien beast in 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 in, uh, in Scandinavia and Denmark because we we were still more performance focused than many companies are, right? So we tried to take the best of a foreign uh, a foreign more performance oriented culture and 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 combine that with uh, you know the slightly softer uh, Scandinavian culture with a little bit of empathy and wanting to. To keep people engaged and and and, and always remembering that uh, when somebody chooses to work for you in a bank or in any other context, you know they're there for their own career. They're there for their own development. They're there to feed their own families. You know they're not there to to make me rich or to make my partner rich, right? Uh, so so there needs to be something in it for everyone. And and uh, and I think we we had for a long time a, a very good culture there that uh, that I enjoyed being part of and and I very often and I'm always pleased when it happens to meet people that have worked at some some point in the past 30 years the bank was 30 years uh, a couple of days ago right uh, uh, I mean there's a big footprint in other businesses in in, in, in FX and derivatives and CFDs and, and this and uh, it's nice to meet people that 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 saw their time in, in Saxo Bank as a, as a good development for themselves and a, and a time that they enjoyed. And, and as you may, may recall, you know, we, we always try to have a little celebration every now and again, have a little bit of fun, because I think that's important too. You know, it's not only, it's not only about uh, maximizing the business outcome. If you don't have a nice time, then, uh, then uh, what's it all worth, right? Yeah, I, I subscribe and I think I'm a huge fan of Saxo Bank and your work precisely since then because of that, that culture and sense of belonging to something bigger than you, but at the same time, something that you respect. And actually, to be honest as well, is I, I've, after having work around the world, it's still one of the things that uh, compelled me in terms of the, the success because there was a productivity, but a sense of culture and a sense of fun. And I, I speak this with a lot of proud because I, I was part of that in a small scale. Um, and I think it's really something that kudos to you and to Kim and to the team because it's really 
quite difficult because creating that culture and keeping the productivity and the results, it's a very difficult task. So um, I think I, I appreciate this and we could talk more from Saxo, but I know that you're still creating the new waves. So <laughs> I think we should also leave them to do their own thing. I have I sold out my practice four years ago and uh, I'm not interfering in it at all. I have my account there, which uh, I'm by no means forced to have, but I do think it's a good platform that we, we built. So I still trade there uh, every now and again. No, fantastic. So, so let's go right now to. So, you made the parallel between forex trading and and crypto trading and Bitcoin. And I know I remember that uh, in two thousand nine or two thousand ten, you were actually presenting your first Bitcoin that you showed to the team. <laughs> I remember that because I was as well researching it. Um, and when I, I left in two thousand eleven, of course, uh, it was three years after the inception. Things start really growing. But two thousand eleven, when you talk about Bitcoin, even at the time. I remember I was working with someone from 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 uh, Barclays, and they were telling me if you tell anyone in the city that you are involved somehow in crypto, you're going to be expelled out London. <laughs> I was looking at the guys, and I said, "Oh, let's talk in a couple of years." But this actually was told by a couple of people. So, can you tell us how did you get into Bitcoin and crypto? Because of course now we're building a very strong blockchain technology platform, and we're going to talk about that. But how did you get into it? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about the timing. So it's helpful that you you bring up those years. I think it was around 2011 that I first became aware of it, and and, and that was more. No, you spoke about it 2009, 2010. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll I'll change my presentation there because that's uh, that was very early. If if that was the case, but I did I did spot it relatively early, or, or friends of mine spotted it relatively early and made me aware of it, and I. Uh, I, I like the idea of decentralization and uh, it, it took me a little while to get convinced myself. Uh, so so uh, I don't think I bought my first Bitcoin before it was around a hundred bucks or something, but I probably saw it at 10. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's my bad. Yeah. But, uh, uh but I, I like the idea, and I actually, I also saw it a little bit as potential trading objects for the platform when it was had matured a bit. I mean, also that market was very thin and very nobody took it too seriously. And I think the the, the few enthusiasts that were there, I think they, in an honest moment, they would they would not really have believed that it had become what it has become. I think oh, that, that that would have been at least only the most crazy enthusiasts, right? Because it was a bit of a French thing back in the day. So I followed that uh, more as a hobby. Uh, I knew the guys uh, before they started Ethereum. And, and so it was a relatively early days in, in that. And I, uh, I was quite enthusiastic. But, but at the same time, you have to remember that my day job was, was being co-CEO of uh, Saxo Bank. And, and, and there, of course, uh, ever-increasing uh, area was regulation and new new legislation, etc. And I kind of couldn't really reconcile these things in my mind. You know, I have these guys that want to be completely free and live on planet blockchain, and over here I have a industry that's constantly being being bombarded with with, with new ideas for regulation. So I increasingly got a bit skeptical about the the, the early generations. You know, I see serious problems with the anonymity obviously some of the tech was not that great i mean it's good tech you know it doesn't break but it wasn't scalable and uh, and even then you know with seven and 15 transactions per second for bitcoin and ethereum which hasn't changed incidentally but but even for us in sexual bank that wouldn't have been enough to to do our trading on it right uh, because we had much higher peak moments right uh, much, much higher. So, so it's quite clear that there's some problems here, scalability lacking, you know, a lack of respect for the world around you, the anonymity aspect, uh, which we know from TradFi, traditional finance, that, that that's an absolute non-starter, right? You need to know who you're dealing with. So increasingly, I got this sort of, you know, this is not going to happen the way that these guys think, you know? And, and that's what led me to start up Concordium, which is really a, an attempt to uh, combine the two things, right? Uh, take what's great about a blockchain, you know, the distributed nature, the no single points of failure, et cetera, that we, that we see all, all, all around us in, 
in the in, in society and certainly in the financial sector you know one one institution goes down and you have a major problem right um uh, so uh, so i thought how do we take those great things and they are great uh could do a lot for, for, for the traditional financial sector also going forward, but married with what I kind of know from, from regulation and from my Saxon Bank day job about how the world really works and, and, and what are the, the intentions of regulators, lawmakers, et cetera. So, so that was kind of the thinking. And, and I think the most critical thing is this thing about anonymity, uh, that that really is a non-starter uh, from a regulatory perspective. And, also a non-starter for corporate or a serious business, you know. So, uh, so that's where we we had as a as a key USP that in order to access Concordium, you have to be ID'd, right? Uh, doesn't mean that we flash your ID left, right, and center, but we need to know that you can be ID'd. And 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 I think the more important uh, use case really is that you and I can ID towards each other if we so choose, right? Uh, Apart from that, that's actually not by far not the hardest thing we did on, on Concordium. And we, we, we tried to build a very solid project, uh, starting out with some world-class cryptographers, because I think the crypto and crypto is cryptography, right? And if you're building a piece of, of, of mission-critical infrastructure, you need to understand cryptography very, very well. And I don't, so I had to find some people that really could do this stuff. So we have some great, great uh, scientists on that, both externally on universities and internally, because you have a responsibility that the cryptography is rock solid, right? There's enough people out there that is going to try to destroy it or hack it, right? Secondly, we, we build it with a tech process, which probably was more inspired by how we did it at at, at Saxon Bank, you know, uh, not, not no sort of five guys and girls in a garage type thing, but uh, but a more corporate tech building process, uh, and and finally adding, you know, per definition myself, but also other people with uh, experience from the old world or the real world or the traditional business world, whatever, whatever you want to call it, because I think that ultimately the merge and it's not the merge everybody's talking about but the merge between the old world and the new world is is when we will achieve real success because certainly blockchain can do a lot of stuff uh, that, that will increase uh, improve processes in uh, in uh, in in old old world processes but, but for sure we can also learn a lot from people sitting in the old world i mean they're not they're not fools or idiots, people sitting in Goldman or JP Morgan and stuff like that. So there's for sure a lot of stuff we can learn the other way as well. And to see those things in the next decade coming together in the financial sector and many other places, I think is what's going to really make a break with the blockchain will be a, 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 a big success story like the internet. I personally believe it has the potential to be something nearly as groundbreaking, but uh, but if it if it does, it needs also to be mainstream adoption and then bigger players that can see the benefit in it. Uh, plus, of course, all the new models that will occur from a well-construed blockchain environment with the right safeguards in place and respect for general general legislation and society around you. Just like in the internet was a combination of improving some processes. Sex banks a very good example, but there are many others. And then ultimately out of that came models that we hadn't even thought about, you know, the social media, the Google, the, those kind of things, right, that were enabled completely by this new technology. And I, th I think this will be similar, you know, there'll be processes that we can improve by the use of blockchain, uh, but there will also be entirely new business models that, you know, you can't really think about them before they're there. and We can't predict them, but uh, but they will come and they will be based on on the extra, extra data security, the the more trust between parties that that uh, that are implicit in, in when when you put something into a smart contract, it happens, right? You put something into an old contract and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on lawyers, that can be very good, and you agree it, but it doesn't guarantee you that it's going to happen, right? Uh, so, for me, <clears throat> finding that that merge between What's great about blockchain 
respecting society around it and adding value to to to, to existing business models, I think is very important. And and that's what we that's kind of what we put Concordium together to do. Yeah, I think the vision is fantastic. I think uh, just for people listening to us, so Concordium is a public layer one science-based blockchain designed to balance privacy with accountability through its ID layer. And we'll put links in the interview for people listening to us on YouTube and our, on the different channels that we're distributing worldwide. Um, and I think the, the advantage is the protocol level ID ensures that every wallet is associated with the real world identity. And I know that this is something that is probably for the more hardcore people in crypto a bit uh, polemic, but for me, actually, it's, it's super important because we cannot continue having um, completely anonymity and I'm completely a, a, a huge fan of what it's trying to do and as well the, the remaining the idea of the ID the third party ID provider so people can comply can comply with each other and trust each other but as well they can remain private with zero knowledge proof and I think that's a big thing that we need right now so Lars one, one of the things that is like you said that is a, a big challenge and of course we are in the, another kind of crazy uh, storm in the crypto world um, and I think it, I think this this happened a lot. To, I was actually comparing the stock of Amazon uh, with Bitcoin, and the stock of Amazon really <laughs> deep a lot of times. And people forget that if you just look at most of the stocks around the internet and most of the shares, they went through ups and downs, massive. And the beginning of the internet was a complete chaos as well. Like you said, it was not so. I remember well, there's there's articles from CNN. Is the internet a fan? <laughs> this is CNN, so people forget that. So, so in terms of uh, one of the things that you touched on, actually, that that is really key is the usability, the UI UX, the platforms, and the scalability of the technology. And this is a big challenge because, for instance, in 2021, well, let's say in 2000, actually 2020, there was around 130 million people using crypto worldwide. In 2021, there was around 300 million, 350 million. So we are still in the beginning. And of course, this year, probably the numbers will not explode because of everything happening. But I'm sure next year we can go to 1 billion because independent of that emerging markets. I remember that uh, I helped create a bank in 2014-15 and it was between Africa and Asia. And uh, one of the things in the first finding we found, this was 2014-15, is that in Africa, most of the medium class was using crypto. And they were not using it because... Uh, they had to, not because of the iPod innovation, but because it was still more um, critical for them than actually the normal local currencies. So as a Forex expert and as well as a technologist and as well as an entrepreneur in Concordium, how do you tackle these different parts? Because I think the challenge here is how do you democratize the platforms and the technology and how you make it compliance with the right, the real world, like you said. You have to play with the institutions. And actually, I think this crisis that we're going through in 2022 is precisely a crisis of maturity. You have to mature, mature the baby because it cannot continue to be a teenager all the time. So how do you see this, especially with the context of Concordia? Because I know that you're doing a lot of international partnerships. You have your coin um, that you're going to put as well. So the, the, the coin is for people listening to us, is um, the Concordium coin that is actually trading. Um, and uh, how do you look at these different things? And the CCD for the people listening to us. Well, I would say that what we are seeing now with the general sell-off is, is probably a little bit like the dot-com crash in 2001, where, as you said, everything ran up. People couldn't, couldn't get into new projects uh, quickly enough, and they didn't care what they paid. And, and, and all of a sudden, the whole thing came crashing down, and, and you nearly started from scratch. Obviously, you had some experiences, uh, but, but what is important to say there is so that uh, most companies actually went under in the dot-com crash. And out of that rose various more solid models uh, that, that, that then prospered and became some of, the, some of the biggest companies in the world in some cases, right? And uh, I think it could be the same here. I don't think you should necessarily expect everything that has gone down to go back up. I think this is also a, a bit of a cleansing process where things that really have very little utility, very little underlying reason to be may not come out of this crisis again, right? Maybe it'll be new projects that uh, that rise from this. So just like, you know, you would probably end up pretty poorly with a portfolio that, that you have bought at the top of the 100 internet companies 2001 i don't necessarily think that uh, 
that just going out and buying blindly now because everything is cheap uh, is the right strategy. I think there's also a, a Darwinistic selection mechanism at, at, at work now where a lot of poor projects will, will get wiped out and, and for whom it will be terminal, right? So question, the big question here is probably Bitcoin itself, right? The Bitcoin has a has a very special status in this, you know, in effect, it can't do much. Uh, it, everything it can do, you have to build outside of it, right? Uh, doesn't scale. It's, it's solidly built, very simple, very simple technology, basically put together by a handful of people in six months, right? But uh, whoever those people were, uh, but but in itself, it's extremely reliant on people trusting Bitcoin to actually be a store of value, right? And uh, that jury for me is still out, right? Uh, it, it will never be, I think, a core platform for for real industrial use because it, it's just so inferior in terms of many things to many of the newer projects uh, that have come along. But the particular status of it being a store of value may or may not uh may or may not survive, you know, I mean, people like to call it gold 2.0. If it gets that role, that'd be nice for Bitcoin. But, you know, we've known about gold as a valuable for about 40,000 years. You can go back and people are collecting little gold nuggets in the caves, right? So has a little bit more history and a little bit more credibility. But, you know, who knows? You should just be aware that it's incredibly dependent on the trust of of the particular community that embrace it at the moment, right? Uh, so uh, the the use of, of crypto uh, in, in in the third world or in emerging markets, I absolutely agree with you. It uh, serves some real purposes there because you have uh, you have local currencies that are extremely volatile themselves, much more than Bitcoin, but only going one way, right? Uh, you have often microtransactions uh, where you need to to send small amounts of money. You have a, a big diaspora of people working abroad that need to send money back to their families. And there, clearly, uh, crypto has gotten a, a role that, that's hard for the traditional money to, to take, right? Because, you know, if you're sending a thousand bucks with the Western Union, they're going to charge you a lot for, for to do that uh, but if you're sending 10 bucks you know they, they won't even do it right uh, so so i think uh, that serves a real purpose you know which i think is is, is quite interesting to see it's a lot of regulatory issues but but let's leaving them aside for now uh, and also inclusiveness to people that actually don't have access to bank accounts again also partially for regulatory purposes but but uh, of, uh, regulatory reasons, but but it serves a purpose. Whereas in uh, in, in 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 more uh, developed economies, you know, to be brutally honest, a lot of this is just is just uh, speculation, right? Uh, and then there's this new sort of group of blockchains coming up that you can actually use for something, right? That 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 are built to support real usage uh, in terms of scalability, in terms of Good, good smart contracts, etc. And I think that is for me what's what's the exciting part. You know, I, I don't really care much whether Bitcoin goes up or down, except of course it's a bellwether for the whole thing. And if Bitcoin is high, people are, are, are feeling more wealthy and invest more. So in that sense, it is important. But as a, as a technology for me, I don't think it's that important. I know a lot of people rip my head off for saying that, but I think that so many much more interesting things happening out there, not just us, but a number of other more modern blockchains, right? So uh, so for us, you know, to, you, you gave a nice description of what it is, but in essence, we're trying to build a, a better Ethereum, right? A, a piece of infrastructure that you can actually build your use case on top of, uh, something that is solid, something that can scale, something that is that is built in a, in a solid way and with, with good cryptographic understanding. And then it's really up for you what you what you want to do with that, right? It's a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like the internet, right? Uh, the internet is there. You can build a shop on it. You can build a bank on it. You can build a search engine on it. But, but it's not necessarily the internet itself that comes up with all the ideas. And I don't, I don't see it here either, you know, and you can't really 
call the internet if you have a complaint, right? Uh, so uh, for me, we, if I should make a parallel, we're trying to build a, a good internet for you to build your interesting use case on top of, right? Uh, and whether that use case is better storage of data, uh, supporting a, a providence, uh, a providence structure, uh, you know, helping you uh, distribute your artwork, so your your music or, or building a game and having an in-game economy is really up to you. We're just trying to provide a a safe environment for you to build on it, and I I, I think that uh, that's actually to some extent an unsolved problem in this space, right? Everybody's sort of oh layer one, that's so last year, right? But it's not because we we don't really have anybody out there that fully takes the boxes, right? In terms of scalability, security, uh, cryptographic understanding, a lot of what we're building is built on sand, and occasionally it goes completely wrong. Like Tara is a good example, right? Hundreds of use cases being built on Tara, and all of a sudden the central blockchain goes poof, right? And and all your hard work uh, goes to waste, so you have to start with somewhere else, right? Other blockchains rely heavily, Ethereum in particular, because of the low scalability, but rely very heavily on layer two solutions that, that can deal with that lack of scalability and the very high fees. But those layer twos, by definition, can deal with it because they have some compromises with security that, that Ethereum itself doesn't have, right? So you should just be aware that you should choose your technology here very carefully. You know, you should choose your underlying blockchain you should look very carefully if you are forced to use all sorts of related technologies because all of a sudden you begin to getting more points of failure, right? Uh, and, and and I think blockchain Nirvana is a blockchain that can actually handle this stuff, which means it has to be very scalable, but that you book at least very frequently uh, Merkle trees or collections of, of uh, transactions directly on the blockchain. You know, if we start putting this on non-secure layer twos, we haven't changed much, uh, then we're just back to uh, using any other database, right? Yeah, and I think it's that, a key element. That's what a blockchain is. I mean, let's make it very simple. A blockchain is a database, right? That's what it is, right? It's an alternative to using the database that you normally have. It's actually in most, uh, in most variants a pretty poor database because it doesn't have the scalability, et cetera, because of the consensus layer. Uh, so if you have something where keeping your data very, very secure is not important, I would use a blockchain, right? Uh, if you have something where you want to keep your data secure, on the other hand, a blockchain database is more secure than, than a traditional database where you typically have an institution or a few individuals that control that and they may they may manipulate it uh, they may make mistakes they may delete things in good in good faith or bad faith but you're vulnerable to something going wrong and i think the problem that uh, blockchain really fixes is that if you have a need for very secure data then a blockchain is a very good solution but if you dilute that by then using layer twos that are not as secure you could argue, why don't you stay with the SQL database, right? Yeah, I subscribe completely on this. And I think it's the only way for a blockchain to scale and for achieving uh, what we need in the industry. Because in the end of the day, database, uh, data is everything right now. is the new economy. But data only makes sense if it's secure and if it's trust. Um, so one of the things I want to touch two parts. Uh, I know that we're running out of time, but we have time for two, three more questions. So... Um, one of the things that this is actually coming from your papers, so concording originality is to be compliance oriented and provide a blockchain which meets business needs. And uh, it offers an environment where confidential data about a suspected transaction can be disclosed when requested is substantiated by a court order by, from a relevant regulator. And the CCD token, the concordia token, native token serves to pay transaction fees which are low, predictable and fiat stable. So uh, can you tell us a bit some case studies for people that know less about Concordium, uh, one or two case studies that you think can highlight some of the things that just mentioned from your paper? Yeah, I think uh, if, if you have a high volume of transactions, obviously you uh, not only do you need low fees, but you also need to know that they're not high in 12 months time, right? If you look at Ethereum, uh, three years ago, they were 
use cases being built that work fine under the then conditions, but are now uh, crossed by, you know, 30, 50, 500 dollar uh, transaction fees, right? Which in itself is an absurdity if you want to be a piece of infrastructure. Hence the need, again, to move to layer two solutions where you, you don't have that problem. So the way that we achieve those uh, fixed fees is obviously we don't have a process that, uh, that uh, we're not based on proof of work, right? So we're, we're not based on having to to generate uh, this this uh, this highly complex and highly energy consuming uh, consuming uh, way of, of of reaching consensus. So on on our platform, we can kind of set we can set our own uh, our own transactions fees, and we'll ultimately distribute that out to a, a broader governance. But we have also built a, a function in there called energy, which. Uh, which automatically converts. If you want, you and I want to make a smart contract. We we want to fix the fee for for something at ten euro cents or whatever. We can fix that in a smart contract, irrespective of of C, uh, CCD's uh, uh, price at the time, because there's an automated conversion vis-a-vis -vis an oracle that provides this this price for the fiat currency. So in principle, you can fix your your fees in. Uh, in fiat currencies as well, and I think that's a, that's a key thing for for wider corporate adoption. You know, if you don't know what fees are going to be like in twelve or twenty four months, I mean, some of these projects are complex and might not even have launched till twelve or twenty four months, and then you need to know that your business model is not going to get broken straight away by you adding a lot of transactions to the platform, right? So uh, that I find very very uh, important. Then there's the other aspect of a high level of security. I give you a good example of a use case that we are working at at the moment. We uh, we have partnered up with a company in Holland that's the biggest uh, private sector printer of of stamps and and banknotes. Right, mostly stamps these days because most of the governments have insourced their, their banknote printing, but they actually used to until about five years ago. They're printing most of Holland's uh, euro notes. You know, but uh, but today, very much on stamps, right? Now, what is uh, what is important for stamps and obviously in particular banknotes is that they are very hard to replicate, right? That you you cannot just stand down on your uh, on your Xerox and uh, and make your own banknotes or even your own stamps for that matter, right? So, so they have some very sophisticated printing equipment that uh, that secures the the, the Secures these these items against fraud, right? Now they actually stamps is a is an industry you would have thought was dying because it's not very often that we that we use that anymore. But uh, to some extent, the traditional use of stamps is dying. But it's still the world's largest collector new community, believe it or not. It's still, in spite of crypto punks and and, and whatever have you, uh, gaming yes. games out there, the biggest collecting community in the world is the stamp community, right? Uh, and, and, and they obviously want to sh to continue this into a new generation, right? Because some of these guys are, are perhaps uh, of, 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 a, of, of another generation, although there's some interest in, in, in younger generations for that as well in recent years. But for them to move uh, some of that interest onto collecting NFT-based stamps is, 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 is uh, one way. And then we will actually launch the first nation state quite soon with... Uh, with uh, NFT stamps from from an official national post office, uh, and a lot of that production is actually today going towards collectors. Uh, maybe ten percent of all stamps today are meant for collectors rather than for letters, right? So, in such a scenario where you need to have the same degree of certainty uh, against fraudulent activity, uh, the choice of blockchain is is important, right? You 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 take a lot of care that it's hard to reproduce the, the physical item. You want to have the same degree of certainty that it's not being uh, abused in the, in the virtual space. So there, the combination of our ID layer, our ultra secure infrastructure, et cetera, lends itself very well. So, so that's one use case I could give you an example of, right? But the whole idea that you want to also prove who is the, who is the issuer of, of an NFT? Who, who does it actually come from? You know, 
perhaps also who is it going to. If you want that information, you can ask the person for it. And if he wants to give it to you, he can do it. Still a private ID. Uh, but if he doesn't want to do it, you just don't sell to him if it's a precondition for you to know that, right? So uh, in areas like that where we're linking closely together the issue, of, and I would say that goes for actually for most NFTs, there's a lot of fraud and in general IPR, intellectual property rights, where you know you're selling a design, you're selling you're selling an artwork, you're selling a, a, a valuable digital file. You want to have that strong link between who you're actually buying it from, which also makes it easier to spot uh, people that have basically ripped you off, right? Uh, so I think uh, those are very good use cases uh, for that. And then I would say, you know, this industry tends to jump on every buzzword it can find, right? And the latest one is probably metaverse, right? Oh, metaverse, blockchain, same thing. Well, it's not the same thing at all, right? Actually, I don't see any intrinsic need for blockchain for metaverse. We've had metaverses for many, many years. Uh, Second Life was a metaverse. You know, there was no blockchain. The Sims in 1989 was a, was a metaverse. No need for blockchain, right? Uh, uh, so what you need a blockchain for in there is if you have, you can also argue with most games, are a type of metaverse, you know, and again, no blockchain, right? So there's no direct link between link uh, between blockchain and metaverse. But where there is an interesting link is if if you have a well-functioning metaverse and you have an in-game or an in-metaverse economy and you want to secure some assets that are floating around in there being bought and sold, if you want to know who you interact with in a metaverse, an ID layer could, could come in very handy, right? So you can actually ID yourself to somebody else in the metaverse so that's where I think it plays a role if, if you have that particular need, right? And you might not always have it. You know, if you go into a metaverse and you're dancing around the dance floor and watching a, 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 a digital uh, concert or something like that, you may not need to know who you're dancing with, right? Just like you go down the pub, you don't start asking everybody for their passport before you order a beer, right? Uh, but then if it goes beyond that and you want to do a piece of business or you want to exchange a value or something like that, or you want to be absolutely sure who the other person is, then uh, an infrastructure like Concordium could come in very handy. And that's where I see more the role of blockchain. If you have in-game or in-metaverse economies that you need to have safe and secure, that's the role of blockchain more so than anything else, right? And, uh, and uh, we see some requests around that as well because, you know, everybody wants to build a metaverse right now. And, uh, I think we are going to see a lot of failed attempts in that space, but uh, but I think the ones that succeed will actually, at least for part of their activities, have a need also for a safe economy inside those metaverses. Yeah, and I think that's a uh, I completely subscribe, and I love your metaphor from uh, from uh, and, uh, if you go to a party, they really don't need to ask the passport, especially if you want to answer someone. That's a great one. I think you need to quote that <laughs> in your Twitter. Um, it's a good one. We'll use it here. So I think one you wrote recently an article with precisely the CEO of the bank notes and stamp printer, uh, Royal John uh, and Shell and and uh, I love the, what you guys wrote because this quote, I think, touches what you said, but I think gives a bit new direction. So this metaverse application could revolutionize the way, and I'm quoting you guys, the way we think about, among other things, the value of physical nodes in the digital world, which in turn might, might ensure their survival in the fundamentally or entirely digital world we are fast approaching. But in order to, to for that reality to fully manifest, we must ensure it is built on a safer, more trustworthy, and ultimately contrafate free foundation. So I want to pick on this because this was in the context of what you just said, the bank notes, the collectives, which at the moment 90% of the, or 80% to 90% of the NFTs is collectives. So that's where people are going. Actually, the art world is still big, but not considerable to what is going on. And like you said, it's just digital collectives. But on the metaverse, we're going to have one thing, and, and I, I want to be a bit more provocative as my last two questions or three, if you have time still at least five, 10 minutes more. So one of the challenges right now is that we have our digital avatar. And our digital avatar, I'm not talking still with the avatars, which like you said, in metaverse is going to be much more advanced and, and actually disclose that I'm building this technology myself. But the challenge is that we have already a data avatar. 
there's a large data avatar that Google and all these guys have, Dinesh and everyone listening to us. And you can buy this data. There's a price for that. And then, of course, when you start configuring the ID of this data, which is what you guys are doing in Concordia, this is a big thing. And I think this is the biggest thing in the internet because there's no ID. There's no global ID for us. And this is fragmented for us. Actually, Denmark, I live six years between Denmark and Sweden. There's a personal number. You actually are more advanced on that than it was done without blockchain. But uh, the point is that is that, that is a good reflection, but and it only works for your country. So the point right now is that this is digital ID in the physical world and the digital world is going to be leapfrog with the metaverse because the metaverse technology for instance just by 2030 will be a 13 trillion dollars industry which is uh 10 times bigger than actually all the crypto in the world so uh, and this is actually Citibank research so how do you see this because i think this is the convergence of data and i think this is where concordium can make a big impact but as well as where the industry needs to go a step ahead because it's like you said, it's not just uh, solving the speculation or creating another speculation on the central land or sandbox, but creating real cases utility. And you mentioned utility before, which I think is for me the most important. Yeah, I, w- I would say it. I am a strong believer in something metaverse, right? There's, it's clear that our technology is driving us towards, with some speed, towards a, a place where we can have quite meaningful experiences in a digital world. And if you think that, 20, 30, 40 years into the future, I actually think that we'll be spending a very substantial amount of our time in in in, in real real life situations, but in, in the metaverse, right? And they will be very genuine and they may actually give us the opportunity to experience experience lots of things that we wouldn't be able to to experience in, in our everyday physical life, if you will. So I'm a big believer and that can only get ever ever bigger i think it's maybe to the point that in in a hundred years you know we may be living on nearly all of our existence there because be awful lot more exciting than walking up and down your local street right so uh so that is a movement no question Uh, we're not very far in that movement it's not all that convincing yet but but it will come and that means of course that shops will want to sell in there people want to do business people want to meet other people uh socially uh in, in in many ways right and then as that becomes more and more con, you know consuming of of the time we spend in the real world or the traditional physical world there's nothing unreal as such about a, a virtual universe in my view is also real but but you know what i mean right uh there of course uh in the in the in the physical world if i meet you on the street and I know how you look, you know, I can be pretty sure unless you have a one double, you know, that it is actually you, right? Whereas uh, in a metaverse, I could have somebody with a perfect avatar of you and I would uh, probably be sure it was you, but it could be somebody entirely different, right? And and for that, of course, you need to, to have some possibility of identification, right? You have to have this option to be able to prove to each other who, who we are. It could also be that you want to look like a dinosaur and I want to look like an elephant, but 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 we could still prove that we were Dennis and Lars, right? And then the more important, the more the bigger part of our economy that becomes, uh, the more important that becomes, right? And, and the more of our lives that are lived in these environments, which I think for people that are very young today will be a very substantial part of their lives. Uh, the more important all these things are. The other thing that's very important is, uh, you know, the assets in there. I mean, can you really prove that there's only one of these and one of these or a hundred of these or whatever the number is? Uh, Today, no. I mean, if you go into a game, you know, you can buy all this extra stuff that they make lots of money on, but can you be 100% sure that they don't just print another thousand or or that there are more in existence than than than, uh, than you think, right? Uh, there, there's actually quite a bit of pushback from the big gaming publishers because they they have this economy today and they don't see any particular benefit in in a blockchain coming in and messing with with a nice economy that they have. But the gamers themselves should be increasingly demanding that they're not at the moment, which I I fully understand the publishers, but I don't really understand the gamers because they. Some of these guys are the same guys that say, oh, we're so reliant on single points of failures in banks. They say, well, you're dependent on a single point of failure in a game, right? Uh, 
so I would have thought that they have a strong interest in the economy becoming more independent, more safe, uh, more secure from that particular from that particular single point of failure that they're now interacting with, right? So in short, I think the metaverse is big, whatever it is, because there's going to be many, many attempts at building this and maybe in a far future, something something merging around a very large you know, uh, metaverse, but there'll still be lots of side pockets without question. Uh, but inside that, if it becomes very important, you, you, need, you need security. And actually we have the, we have the opportunity here to, to have a much safer world, you know, because we can know who we're dealing with. We can know whether they own or don't own the things they they say that they own. We, we can know that the stuff they're selling us is not counterfeit or fraudulent, you know. So actually, I think uh, well thought through blockchain uh, projects, they are a great enhancer of that, a great enhancer of trust and people feeling much more comfortable to, to put some of their economy in that direction, which should be in in all the commercial organizations' interest. Uh, completely, uh, I completely agree with you, and it's really a key element. I think in the end of the day, it's about trust. Anything that is money or value is about trust. But I think is that the new directions will be depending on what we do now. So as as so last, if, time, I mean, you, Dennis, if, if if you get a message from somebody on Instagram or Facebook Messenger or something like that, and it's a little bit odd or it doesn't sound like like the friend you think it is. Uh, I mean, you go and you go and check that, right? You're concerned. You may not even answer a person that uh, that you don't know, right? Uh, because you have no way of verifying their their credentials, right? Uh, and frankly, it happens to me many times a year. Somebody makes a fake profile on Instagram, or they make a fake profile on Facebook, and they take a little bit of my CV and a picture of me and uh, repost my last ten posts, and then they start sending messages out to my friends uh my social media friends my my people that i interact with and saying you know i have a special deal for you if you send me 10 bucks i'll send you a bitcoin or something like that right so we don't have that trust today and then i certainly if i see something from somebody where the name is clearly fake and they got zero followers and they were initiated yesterday that's like a danger signal right uh so uh we, we can solve all these problems. I mean, we could solve them today. But I think in a, in, one thing is who writes you on Instagram or who writes you on a Facebook messenger, right? But, uh, but if you're spending a lot of your economy and a lot of your time in a metaverse or for that matter, in, in a, one of the social media, you know, we, we, we can't really do that comfortably because we, we're so unsure about what we're dealing with, right? That we're unsure if people have the rights of what they're trying to flock we're unsure if they are who they claim to be etc right uh, so I, I think we have a lot to offer this industry from the blockchain space to make everybody more comfortable interacting and hence being more active users and, and of higher economic value to these platforms right yeah, and I think that happens every day. Okay, I, I have, in fact, a lot of people pretending to be me on Instagram, and actually some of them did exactly what you said. Actually, I have cases of people coming to me, okay, I actually send money to a profile of yours. So this happens as we speak, and it's a big problem in the internet, which we have most of bots. That's the fight between Elon Musk and Twitter, but this is a big problem. And it's a big problem for the internet at, at large. And this this becomes two ideas. So I'm cautious of your time and I appreciate so so large that we didn't touch. Uh, so I think just as a wrap up on Concordium, I think what's your vision and your management team for the next, let's say, couple of years? I know that you have a lot of things going on. So like the things that you have for the present and future that uh, on the top of, if there's anything you want to highlight that. I, I think I, I kind of described, we want to build a piece of really, reliable infrastructure that service needs for people that want to build their own use cases. We might build a few use cases and I'm involved in various projects, but really I want to give a piece of infrastructure that uh, if, if you're a corporate or a use case or whatever you are, you can build on in comfort. And if you feel you have the need for this particular ID aspect, well, then we have pretty obvious choice because not really anybody else does that. Right. But, but my vision for this is really just continuing to build a really, really solid blockchain. We'd like to say the world's best blockchain has got to be the ambition, but, but we certainly want to be one of them, right? Uh, and, and, and build something that can make 
that can tick all of the boxes, tick the boxes of no anonymity, tick the box of scalability, tick the box of being able to go through a, a, a take due diligence, you know, tick the boxes of, of, of through the ID having accountability, but at the same time, privacy also, because privacy is completely different to anonymity, right? Uh, privacy, I think, is uh, nearly a, a human right for, for interactions, but but anonymity is not. Uh, or at least you got to bear a lot of consequences that people won't be doing anything with you, right? So, uh, so that's what we're trying to do. And of course, we, as a secondary thing there, is trying to, make people aware that that's what we're doing, right? Uh, build a, a bigger ecosystem, get more use cases, get some, hopefully a lot of smaller, fun use cases that do many of the things that we do today, but also get some some really serious corporate use cases that can show to other corporates, you know, hey, here's a way that we can actually do this in a in a distributed permissionless way without the without having all sorts of worry about the tech and the security and the reputational risk, et cetera, right? So, so that is our, our, our key focus at Concordium. And uh, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm happy to report that I, I think we have a clearly growing inflow of use cases that begin to see this, begin to see that you also need to do some due diligence on, on the tech you use. You know, it's not just whoever gives you the biggest grant I'll build there will it doesn't help you if that blockchain disappears in a year's time, right? So uh, I'm 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 very positive on what we're building. I think it's uh, it is really developing the way that we wanted it to, and I'm also uh, more and more optimistic around our ability to actually get that message out to people. But of course, there's a lot of people that are vying for attention, so it's a highly competitive market, and and for us to get some real sort of milestone use cases that prove to other corporates that, hey, we can actually use this for something, I think it's very important. Wonderful. And I think it's a, a powerful powerful message that we need in the blockchain world. So to finish, and I think uh, to wrap up, and I want to touch Sire Capital, which, uh, of course, uh, it's one of your initiatives that has been going since, especially after your uh, you left Saxo um, completely. So... I don't know if you want to talk a bit about it. About uh, uh, so we'll put as well the link sirecapital.com and is your family office and investment vehicle. Yeah, that's what it is. It actually has existed for a long time because it's my old holding company. But I, when I left the bank, I thought I better sex it up a bit and give it its own identity. So the company okay. has existed for a long term and was always the vehicle I used to own my shares in Saxo Bank, etc. Right. So today I have I have. Uh, uh, sort of morphed it into a, a more operational unit, but it's still kind of my family office, I would say, where I do uh, investments in in various things from from that sort of uh, money box that that I have there, and uh, that's where you know you kindly mentioned some of my sports clubs and my restaurants and that uh, all sit in there together with a number of tech things and an increasing number of blockchain things because I'm. I'm, I'm I'm trying to focus on on investing in various blockchain use cases at the moment because I think that's probably the biggest it's probably the biggest opportunity right now to to get a few ships in the water there before blockchain really takes off you know so so that's what it is I'm actually announcing this week yeah, so yeah I'm almost announcing it here but but uh, but that I have allocated a portion to use cases that want to build on uh, on Concordium either as grants or direct investments. Uh, so somebody's sitting there thinking, I'm building this uh, exciting blockchain use case. This ID thing sounds interesting. Let me have a look. Well, you can also have a look there and, uh, you know, you might be, be lucky to uh, inspire me uh, so much that I that I can help out a little bit financially, you know. So, uh, but it's basically my holding company for all of my investments and, uh, and, uh, and I have an ongoing inflow of investment ideas. I get a lot of people proposing things, and occasionally I I pick some of them and I invest in them. So uh, if you have a great uh, a great idea or uh, an early stage blockchain case, uh, uh, feel free to go have a look and uh, send in the necessary information. And I and my small team will have a look at it. 
Thank you, and I will highlight that. Um, so, so I think probably the the last uh, question that I, I know that we passed one hour and a half almost. So I want to be respectful of your time. I have a lot of more questions, but probably we have a lot of second. last questions. This is like the third in time. In the last ten minutes, so, so <laughs> this will this be the last is, one. Okay, this will be the last one. So, in terms of uh, as as a serial entrepreneur and as well as a successful businessman, for young entrepreneurs and startup leaders, and I think the people that are looking even to blockchain solutions because it's my community, what would be the, the best advice that you give to people? Because I think that's a very important thing for all of us listening. I think, first of all, you really need to, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about people that want to be successful and, and, and make a, a good or even a great business one day. Uh, well, there I would say a couple of things. You know, you have to really love what you do, right? You you shouldn't do it just because you think uh, this is very boring, but uh, probably I'll make a lot of money, right? Because uh, first of all, it will take some time before you do it. And secondly, if you don't really live for that idea, I doubt very much that you will be very successful. So I think even if it makes less money than taking, you know, a different route in the short term, you know, uh, I think you need to love what you do. You need to be, you need to love it enough that you can get out of bed and early morning even if you had a really shitty day the day before so pick something that you that you love and that you think really inspires you and really you think it can make a difference for your clients or for your community or whatever your your your, your project is but but you need to really have a, a deep love for it because there will be hard days and uh, and those ones you have to get through as well Secondly, I would say in the same note, you have to be persistent again for the same reason. There will be hard days. And if you back up every time you have a, a rough ride and say, oh, no, I'll move and try something else, well, then you can just wait for the rough days to show up in that next project, back away from that, go to the third one and wait for the next rough days to show up. You have to, if you really believe in something and you really love what you're doing, you have to be persistent also when stuff is is not so great you know third thing which is very unpopular when i say that in business schools but uh, that i speak to occasionally um you probably sit with some idea that you're going to do something different or better or disruptive or whatever buzzword we can think of but if you know absolutely nothing about that business from practical experience i would say that your 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 chances of success are quite limited right I think uh, if there's something you really you really want to work with, uh, either go and do the hard work of taking a job in that industry a couple of years, and if you already have it, focus on something that you know about because the people you're trying to disrupt are not idiots, you know, and they're not going to lie flat on their back and just say, oh, somebody came with a disruptive idea and I'm going to lie down and die. They will fight back and they will know that business better than you, right? So I think it's important to have at least some knowledge. And of course, depending on your age, how much knowledge can you have? And you shouldn't spend all of your life growing knowledge and then make it, make it, uh, make it your, 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 your startup as a pensioner, right? But, but you need to understand a little bit about what you're doing uh, because the other guys do. The people you're going to compete with do, right? So I think those are sort of the key things. Got to love what you're doing. Got to be persistent. You got to be be a little bit knowledgeable about what you're trying to what you're trying to revolutionize. But apart from that, it's a great thing having your foot under your own table. It's a, it may not make as much money uh, as having a good job in the beginning. It may never, but you may still have a better time because you you're a free person. You you make your own decisions and you you work with something that that you want to work with and that you can have an impact on. So if you have the stomach for it. And you should have the stomach and the persistence. Uh, then give it a shot. You know, if you think, oh, "Wow, that's a little bit too risky for me," uh, there's nothing wrong with having a good job. Most people in this world have good jobs that uh, hopefully some of them are happy and fulfilled. So you need to have it in your stomach. But if you do have that stomach for it and prepared to take some risk, then it's a great thing to do. If if, if to, to to be the master of your own destiny, if you will. 
Amen. This is wonderful and inspiring words. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> now I respect and I wanna, I'm very grateful to have you here. I think probably I'll repeat another one more on the technical part of your team in the future. But I really appreciate your time. It's been a very inspiring moment. And uh, it's one hour and a half. I think I have questions for two hours more, but probably do that over a good wine uh, or something like that in the near future. Thank you so much, Lars. Thank you for having me and good luck with everything. Thank you so much.